As I said, I think it has been a tremendously enlightening morning, and uh, and uh, I wonder if there is some mathematics to this. <laughs> no, seriously. What do you think, Thomas? What, what are your reflections? Yes, you know, I'm a psychotherapist too. <laughs> And uh, I can make a bridge of the uh, several contributions this morning, um, beginning with Stephen Butchovs uh, and following uh, uh, Professor Stoyanov and yours and last uh, as bridge. Um, they all show uh, that person-centered medicine uh, combines with a strong emotional participation uh, uh, in the patient's lives, including uh, not taking notice uh, of their narratives instead of simple medical reports, and including all these supportive needs uh, that are needed by the team, as you stressed it. You did not stress it explicitly, but implicitly all of your work is a teamwork, and um, this team functions very good. So this is a, a very important supportive surrounding for providing a person-centeredness, including emotional participation. And if this uh, emotional participation is to come, then we need a very strong basis on empirical science <laughs> and on environmental environmental men ah oh, shit <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> environmental uh, supporting structures that help us to go in this type of jungle because it's a jungle these are emotions these are feelings these are fears hopes, joys, and it refers to our vocation and not only to our technical providing of support. So the first point that Stephen Buto made is very important. Within the center of person-centered medicines are also we ourselves as person. We need respect, we need protection, we need time, we need money, so to say, things to, to support us, to open our ears and hearts to the narratives and the inner life of the patients. And if we do not have a strong enough basis, we will have a burnout. Thank you. Yes, well, yes, please. Yeah, yeah, it's you. Yeah. Um, I'd like to speak to Stephen uh, first. Uh, I'm interested in, in your book project looking at um, moral equality in the healthcare setting. Um, but to, to take the, the sort of framework that you're trying to develop further, I, I thought it might make sense to th think about what, what exactly you're, you're trying to do when you, when, you, uh, when you make an argument for moral equality, which of course, it is is helpful, and and it's a good it's a good opening point because sure we can all agree that we're all human beings, even physicians, are human mm -hmm. beings, and therefore deserving of uh, 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 of respect. Um, but it struck me that what what you're really trying to do here is is you're trying to protect physicians from what can be the harms of a of a complex caring relationship, and that that speaks to our second speaker too, um, who's worried about. Um, uh, a burnout. So um, you, you suggested that you thought virtue ethics might be uh, a good way to begin. And I wondered if you might think about uh, care ethics instead, only because while well, virtue ethics would um, uh, emphasize the uh, good qualities and characteristics of, of the physician and of the patient too, um, the, the care ethics, of course, is, is grounded in the relationship, which is exactly where this problem arises. Care ethics uses the sort of mother-child relationship as the paradigm of an ethical relationship. Of course, that's very appealing. What's more wholesome than, than a mother-child relationship? But at the same time, uh, there's, a, there's a feminist angle to that, 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 uh, that um, theoretical framework, 
which worries about the excesses of that, where, where we, don't, we don't want the, the selfless mother who, who um, commits herself beyond, uh, beyond a sustainable relationship. So I, I wondered if a care ethics might be uh, a, good, a good place to begin thinking about um, how to um, preserve the, 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 the status of the physician in, in a good, in a good uh, productive relationship. Yes, thank you, Maya. Yes, please, Stephen. The reason I didn't do that, and you may not agree with the, the argument, but I read a very interesting paper which suggested that the uh, reason that I didn't add care ethics is that I have subsumed care ethics within yes. virtue ethics. So this was the argument that this paper presented, that actually it's simply a subset of virtue ethics and doesn't need... But I mean, I, that's a, I, I'm not precluding a discussion of care ethics. Um, I'm open to hearing, learning more whether I should perhaps separate them, but that was an interesting paper that I could share with you. You obviously have thought about things. Yes, yes, please. Um, yes, I'm just going to put on my real clinical hat here. Um, and also report something from my PhD where I interviewed fellow GPs about engagement. It was about care of chronic illness. And the whole thing about it is you have to actually choose who you engage with because a blanket opening of your soul to every person who comes in to see you, the 25 this morning and the 25 in the afternoon, actually will just drain you. What, it doesn't matter how supported you are. And people... Are, some people have great dependency needs and will attach to the clinician and there will be no benefit achieved by fostering these dependency needs and, and creating dependency that is going nowhere. And it's very interesting when I interviewed my GPs about chronic illness care a long time ago, they said they actually had said they made conscious choices. It's very interesting talking to them, what, what do you do, how do you select? And they say, you, we have to select. We have to choose. We have to judge when we will engage emotionally, when we will you know, deflect people to other sources or to social resources. And so this idea, it, it, there's tensions and contradictions in this whole issue of patient or person-centeredness. And there has to be a lot of clinical judgment and uh, protection. That's my comment. Would some of you like to comment? Yes? I, I was, what really struck me about what you said is that actually the, 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 the uniqueness perhaps of the primary care model that you're describing, which is basically cradle to grave relationships which GPs have with, with their patients, um, is something that I hadn't really ever appreciated. We take it for granted as patients. Um, but um, the principles, for example, that I was talking about uh, in my presentation would have very clear beginnings and endings. So we would have a client for a period of days or maybe weeks, but there is always an end date. Uh, occasionally we bring people back on service. But our, our relationships are very much geared towards um, uh, sort of end dates. I mean, you don't have an end date in primary care. I mean, that's yeah. the thing that's, which is where I think looking at the work that Drossy has been doing on, on burnout is really important for, uh, I guess, primary care physicians particularly to pay attention to. Because if you're 30 years, relate, you've got a 30 year relationship with, with individuals who you've seen grow up, go to school, have babies. It's more than a marriage. You know, it is. It is it's quite, much more. I it's think it's, more, yeah. it's extraordinary. Yeah, it's yeah. Okay. <laughs> Are you finished, Jonathan? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just a light bulb. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I just asked for ten seconds, which yes. is I wanted comment, just yes. wanted to mention something that my good colleague at work did, which was write a really interesting editorial for the BMJ on whether GPs should go to patients' funerals mm. at the end of life, and that isn't that so person-centered. I think it's lovely. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, very briefly, talking about the nature of the relationship, relationship-based care, RCC, which Epstein and Frankel uh, developed in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the 80s and 90s, 
relationship-based care, which Epstein and, and, and uh, Frankel Hold on. Uh, um, <laughs> yes. uh, uh, developed in the 80s, very much making a comeback now. And, and again, something w that was mentioned yesterday about the nature of the relationship uh, in relation to what Carmel has been saying is, is um, Catherine Montgomery, the distinguished medical sociologist, what she talks about a medicine of neighbours, where, you, where you're not a friend, not a friend of the patient, uh, clear ethical boundaries, um, you, you can't be a stranger because there are ethical implications there, but you, you act in the manner of a neighbour. You're not, you're not dependent on your neighbours, but you rely on your neighbours. You, you have a relationship with your neighbours, but it, but it is not, uh, but, it, but it is a healthy one. It is a, it is a social one, and it is a supportive one. But there are clear, uh, uh, clear boundaries, clear expectations on both sides. And I think it's really operationalising that, that theory in the relationship that, that would address Carmel's concerns and form a, a good balance between those concerns and, and, and other people's perhaps uh, where, uh, where some clinicians do foster dependency, which is clearly a, 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 a wrong thing to do. So I think it's that middle ground, using that sort of theory and addressing those concerns that perhaps we need to be looking at in terms of PCH. You obviously have good neighbours. I, uh, I agree, but as <laughs> Professor Dorsey has you told have us, to earn, you have to earn there are some personalities <laughs> out there who are after you, and I think a, per a personal oh, reflection, uh, yeah? Uh, You've met personally uh, our rector, and you may remember that he, he's writing yes. aphorisms. Your rector? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, he never translated them. So one of his aphorisms says, the worse your neighbors are, the longer you'll have them. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, I think I saw another hand. Did I? Another command? Yes, please. Uh, yes. Sorry, I, I, I missed the beginning of this Welcome. interesting session. I'd just like to add something to what you said about <coughs> how we are bound to uh, a healthcare system where we are imposed certain medicine and certain uh, therapies because they are reimbursed. Other therapies are not reimbursed. Just to give you an example, so the freedom for a doctor today is heavily limited by the uh, political implications of care. So that is something that I believe uh, it is of relevance and unfortunately we do not have tools to fight this system because the economy comes first and then we have to follow. And I think this is actually a, 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 a sort of situation that uh, makes uh, very difficult to offer very good care. That was a comment to new public management. Yes, Thomas, would you? Yeah. Uh, here comes the argument that Andrew uses. Uh, Person-centered healthcare has proven to be economically more effective. And an argument that you had is also important. We need uh, tests to prove that it is more effective on an economic and uh, health providing level. But, uh, yes, please, yes. I think after here, not the only in this session, but the, the, the previous session as well, I think that we need in, in the forthcoming meeting to invite the politicians. Yeah? yeah. 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 That's all. Yeah. Yes. I, um, I just wanted to make a comment about yes, uh, bil bil building on the, uh, the, the issues of clinical freedom and, uh, and also particularly looking at, at money. Um, I guess what I was describing, um, particularly in terms of the first model, which was the uh, mission avoidance type of model that I was describing, um, the, the, the creation of that service was, was, was as a result of uh, a group of GPs who actually had become so frustrated with the uh, arrangements that were not in place to support patients that they, because they have now got the budget as a clinical commissioning group, uh, were able to carve out some money from that budget and, and set this, this service up. Um, the interesting thing is, uh, and I think the point you made about the politicians is absolutely right, is that the sustainability of all, the, all of this work um, particularly in primary care, particularly from the clinical commissioning groups in the U United Kingdom, um, is almost thwarted at every turn by completely unimaginative people who sit above, if you like, the GP commissioners, and whose role is to 
uh, is to ensure that the, these GPs who are pretty sensible human beings in my experience just don't go off the rails and spend all the money. Um, and the, the real issue, I think, Salman, that I, I would agree with you is that we can, as much as it may not be palatable to us as clinicians, we have got to get involved with the system and we've got to get involved in, in those, 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 those roles within those higher level commissioning groups in order to be able to make the arguments um, about what is required. I'll give you one personal example. When I sat on the board of the uh, Oxford Radcliffe Hospital as the Director of Nursing, um, I had picked up and started getting fed up with the fact that if I came around the wards on a Saturday morning, quite often patients were waiting, sitting next to their beds with no sheets on their beds because of the fact there were no sheets. When I looked into it, um, basically we didn't have enough sheets or change of, change of linen per bed for the hospital of, you know, a thousand beds. So I put a case together, took it to the board, and I was up against, interestingly, one of the radiologists who wanted a, 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 a really important machine. Now, if I hadn't been able to describe the clinical benefit of the fact that we needed more sheets, because otherwise it would have come as a facilities management bid and it would have just been ignored, if I couldn't describe real patient examples of how patients were not getting good care as a result of that, then we would not have got those sheets. Um, and I would, uh, you know, and I, it's about 10 years ago, and I think the radiologist is now beginning to speak to me. But the, the, tr <laughs> the truth was, is that we got to engage. We, if person-centered care is going to be promulgated, then we have, to we have to influence politicians. But more importantly, we have to make the arguments to our colleagues. And it's not just the financial arguments, which we can make, but it's also the clinical narrative that we can bring, which actually, if you talk to the most hard-bitten finance director, you know, and make a point, then, you know, they'll start negotiating with you. It's a bit of give and take. Thank you. I will use my privilege as a chairman to make a few comments now. Uh, as for involving the politicians, I am absolutely, I agree, but I think what we are doing now and should keep on doing is exactly what you have pointed out, Andrew, in the, la in the, in the editorial to this uh, newest selection of commentary papers. Let us get our theory straight. Let us really decide what we're up to because there have been so many counter movements and they are out there somehow and they are more or less being ignored because they cannot contain the whole story. I mean, there are devils at the, in the deep of the test tubes. We need doctors who really know their biomedicine. We need doctors who respect stories and at least not obstruct them in, in the setting. And I think we, we can actually do well um, sorting out our theory, and I think the, the wonderful philosophers we have in the group, together with healthcare personnel, I think we should stay a little secluded for a while, because uh, this is going to make a change, isn't it? I mean, that's the whole idea. And I think it's best not to be premature going out uh, waving our flags, because we are not really there yet, I think, sorting out what kind of ethics, and, and so perhaps after the next meeting, the group would be ready, I, I don't know. Another thing I, I was so struck uh, with the burnout uh, lecture is I remember a lecture I attended, I think it was 99 or 2000, where a lecture was pointing out um, a paper to me from the Harvard Business Review. It is one of those very famous papers called Fair Process. It has to do with organizational culture. And this lecture pointed out that it had all the elements of salutogenetic theory from Antonovsky, the parallels of a salutogenetic uh, organization and, and what is, uh, according to Antonovsky, creating health in, in an individual was striking. And I think this burnout uh, approach or flame out really connects to this uh, basic understanding. And another thing I, I think is important, I, I don't like the psychiatric way of, of categorizing people too much, but I think the idea of personality, of course, is very important to be able to distinguish what is my problem and your problem and that uh, feeds back on don't let patients eat you. I mean, how to be there, but being able to take a distance when needed so that even the dependent people get what they need but without consuming the, the carers. So I think uh, there are so many things to balance, not too much diagnosis, not too little, and all this. Um, would you like to comment on that uh, from the burnout perspective or flame out, yeah? Uh, just to add that uh, it is not only patients who consume you, <laughs> it is your colleagues who consume you. Yeah. Okay. It is the system which consumes you. Yeah, right. Elizabeth, do you feel like you're entering at this? Uh, I'm just 
just sitting here thinking about uh, systems and and I do think that one has to challenge the system, Salman, because we know from not just patient stories and our own experience, but we know from public opinion at times that people are dissatisfied with what the health service is providing. That might be flamed by the tabloid press, but as you said, they tend to get the cur to the colonel. And I think that, um, I'm not sure if there's a theory uh, behind this, but it seems to me that every system that I've ever worked in, nearly everyone, will try and get the most out of you that it possibly can. And the example I would, I would um, draw on is as a junior house officer when I trained, we worked very, very long hours. We were young, young doctors. There, there is an argument that you should work very long hours to get the experience, but we sort of were clocking up over 100 hours, 130 hours work a week. And we would work very long weekends. We would start on Friday, and we would continue until Monday. We'd be on call and bleep up. And I wrote something about this, um, uh, which struck a chord with a lot, of, a lot of colleagues. And that system was clearly not a good one for anyone. But it was changed. And it was changed, I remember, by junior doctors and something to do with the European Union and working hours. Um, so I don't think that we should say, oh, you know, we, we, can't, we, can't, we can't fight these things, or not have the imagination to see the system, the, the kind of care that we would consider to be safe and reasonable. Uh, so I, I, just, I just, you know, I understand the inequality of Andrew, you wanted, somebody else just raise your hand, but Andrew, please, I, I please. Yeah. make a brief, brief point, really, in response to, 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 to what Salman, oh, sorry. I just wanted to make a brief point in, in response to what Salman is saying. Uh, well, actually, uh, yes, I do think organizations uh, can change, even when, the, even when you think, God, no, they, they'll ne they never will, because there are so many examples of, of, of even sudden changes. So, yes, they can change. We, we shouldn't be too pessimistic and say, we're slaves of the system. It's not going to change. We're going to have to settle down, and, and we, ha we can have no ambition, no vision. It's, it, it's all a waste of time. I think that sort of pessimism is, should be thrown out of the window. Really, I do. Um, and although medicine may be advancing rapidly techno technologically in, in, in a very rapid fashion, I mean, that's undeniable, so also are, is patient power. I mean, now patient education, patient advocacy, advocacy and empowerment is, is also uh, uh, um, advancing extremely rapidly. Every single um, chronic illness now uh, has uh, uh, at least one, sometimes two, three, four, very, very well coordinated, highly vocal uh, uh, patient organizations with tremendous political uh, uh, connections and tremendous political impact. And we should use these organizations, and I fully intend to use them uh, and bring them into next year's meeting. Uh, uh, and because I guess I, I, I have an optimism based on the fact that we are, I can observe that there have been sometimes sudden changes and that the system as it is, can be collapsed, if necessary, into something better. That's all I'd like to say. Mm. I think we should be visionary, but I think we should be optimistic based on empiric, based on ob direct observation. Thank you, Andrew. Can I just make one comment? To be wary of some patients funded <laughs> by industry, by, by industry yeah. and um, yeah. it's, it's very... It, One has to listen to what they're saying and who, who may who's be telling saying, them what to say. To of course, saying, we should be so in Norway, we have an almost militant uh, group uh, fighting for the biomedical explanation of chronic fatigue. I know you have it in England too. And I think the problem with patient organizations is that they are working according to the silo uh, model that biomedicine has been working. And we are trying to get rid of that to a certain extent in favor of a more systematic <coughs> narrative way of seeing things. So people are fighting for mostly or more in their silo, which is not sustainable and probably not the right way to go. So yes and no, I think, regarding to, at least one has, has, has to pick one's uh, patient representatives with some care. Yeah. Uh, Michael, you had a comment, didn't you? Well, I mean, I was just, I mean, it was just as responsive. I mean, yeah, the point about changing the system is important. And, you know, sometimes you do have to just have a more bolshy workforce. And there are times when you want to say, like Stephen's point at the beginning, that Daily Mail headline that said, so doctors are to blame for not, for not saving this person. He said, you want to say sometimes, no, this is systemic. I mean, it's a good system. But then as, as, others, as other contributors have said, 
part of that is about changing cultures and talking to our colleagues and finding out which managers you can talk to and which ones you can't, and working out where you can practically get. But there's an underlying ethos, and it's exchange. I think there are broader philosophical questions that, is, that go way beyond the health service about what we mean by rationality and professional conduct. So in my own work context, I mean, I have been accused of what I suppose you would call parentalism on, some, on certain occasions. Uh, in terms of my relationship with certain of my students and former students and some of the younger sort of employees who are employed on sort of hourly paid contracts and so forth. Um, and I've been criticised sometimes for, well, I mean, you've made the point about going to patient funerals. I mean, I've, out of three, three students that I've lost over the last few years who were ex-students of mine who died very young, the only, one, the only one I can really deal with is the person whose funeral I went to for all sorts of interesting reasons. Um, but I was accused, there was, there was, I won't go into the details of it, but I was trying to defend an hourly paid colleague and it got to say, the head, of, the head of department at the time, I had sort of won the moral argument, he knew this person had been treated very badly by the system and his only response to me when he, I put this to him in his office, he got very angry and said, your problem is, your problem is you're, you think you're everybody's died, you are not his died, it's not professional. And, of course, he was just flustered. And the point of it was, he's, there's a concept, we, there are underlying conceptions of what we mean by professionalism and good conduct, which are, you know, certain people think it means dehumanising things. You shouldn't be so involved. Now, if we actually think that that is wrong and we've got to a stage where it's going to do us damage, we, there's an underlying, so I have worries about things that are happening in all sorts of ways society, and apart from education, you know, look at the way, you know, Security systems, for instance, the privatisation of security, where you know you have people, you know, you have people who don't care about the job they're doing in quite the same way, uh, and ha don't have the kind of training as the people used to have. There's all sorts of issues about depersonalisation that are going on, and to my mind, where we're going is up for grabs. And you know, movements like this are part of, seem to be part of a broader picture. And I don't, you know. I just think that's something to bear in mind when we think about other service industries and so forth. Thank you. I think we should be closing up now. I will let each one have a very short, brief uh, final comment, and then we will start, stop on sharp Scandinavian time. Very short. Stephen can be first. Um, the only comment I've got to Michael is that I can completely empathise with you. I've had that experience too. I've been told that I care too much about my students. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I know how you feel. I can say uh, in response to Andrew that, that we should really be optimistic about system change. And I'm saying this uh, from the standpoint of uh, a person who comes from a country which is undergoing transition for the last 20 years. It has changed enormously, indeed. Um, I'll just tell a very short story. The most senior, most um, accomplished, very famous um, professor of oncology told us when we were uh, just starting clinical training that we should treat each patient as if they were our parent. I don't have anything to add, actually. I think. Yes, Thomas, are you uh, yes. burning to have the last word? Please. You asked me for mathematical issues. <laughs> yes. And if we are talking about system and about on the one side and about our individuality and protection on the other side, this is a typical mathematical example because we all as elements belong to a set, a mathematical set. And the set is made of those parts of us that are identical for any element, okay? And the individual parts are those that distinguish one element from the other. And the discussion now, from a mathematical point of view, is the relation of the one part that is the same for all, the one that we are forced to, to belong to, the system that we are in, or the protective team that we are in, it may be a good system or a bad system, and the individuality that we have to protect 
Um, this is the, the element part. Well, that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for this session. It has been a lovely morning. Thank you very much. <laughs>